Good morning, church family. How are we all doing this morning? Good. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Matt. I'm one of the inner rim uh, worship leaders here this morning. Um, we're going to just get started here in just a quick second here uh, with some music. But if you want to just stand up, take a quick moment to just greet someone around you. Um, do we have any announcements this morning that we need to mention really quick? Nope, that's all right. Hey, we're all about community up in this, child, up in this church, so uh, I'll just uh, hand it on over to Jed here in just one second. Sorry, I'm, I'm not usually a chatty Kathy, but I got caught up this morning. Uh, <laughs> well, welcome to church this morning. We are glad that you are here. Um, you know, it's a beautiful day. We got some rain. It's not as hot as last week, which is great. Um, I am a little worried about the humidity for today after the rain, but... Um, we are glad that you're here. I do have a couple of announcements for you. Um, number one, um, we have a new Connect card in the back of our seats. Um, here, yeah, Josh. Um, these are super handy. Um, they're just a good way for us to, to keep in contact uh, and get some quick information. And so what we would like, um, we've realized that our database on our computer is getting kind of old and outdated. Um, and we need some updated information. So if you would like, um, if you would fill out the Connect card, um, even if you've gone here for years, we just want to make sure that we have all your information up to date. So if we do need to contact you, that we can get a hold of you. Um, and so you can fill that out, and you can drop it back in the box where, you, uh, where we give offering. Um, and there's also, there's a thing on here included um, for the newsletter, that if you want to uh, receive our uh, weekly newsletter, either online or via snail mail, um, there's a box you can check. Just make sure if you do want the online one that you include your email so we can get you signed up for that. Um, we just want, want to make sure that we're communicating the best as possible with people. Uh, and so if you would be willing to do that, that would be amazing. Uh, the other announcement that I have for this morning is um, CIY Move for our high school students. It's a, it's a student conference um, that we go to every year. It's a ton of fun. Um, this year we are going down to um, John Brown University in Arkansas um, for a week. And we're going to, you know, it's a week of teaching and worship and fun and games. Um, the students have an amazing time. Um, I could tell you story of story of story of students whose lives were changed at CIY and um, who made some uh, important commitments uh, to, to their life with Jesus at CIY. Um, and so we're going to be uh, just raising some money to help these students out and cover some costs of this trip. And so back outside of the sanctuary in the foyer, there's a table and it has a bunch of envelopes on it. And those envelopes have different money amounts on them. Um, and the way it works is if you would like to give, you can grab an envelope, whatever one you feel comfortable giving. Um, and there's enough um, envelopes that if we uh, use all of them, uh, we can actually completely cover the cost of the trip uh, for the students who are going, um, which would be absolutely amazing, and it would be a huge blessing for them and their families. Um, and so along with the card, inside the card, there is a, a inside the envelope, there's a little card um, and, and it's just a little thing to remind you to be praying for these students. And so it has their names on it, and it has when we are going, and it's just a little laminated card for a reminder, hey, I need to be praying for these students who are going on this trip, um, that their relationship with Jesus can be impacted and grown during this trip. Um, and if you don't want to give financially, that's completely fine. Um, there are some of those cards also sitting on that table that you can just grab if, um, because we would still love you to be praying for those students. Um, and praying for this trip, especially for me, because I always get incredibly nervous taking students anywhere. So, um, but yeah, and so with that being said, let me pray, and then I'll hand it back off to Matt, and we can worship this morning. Uh, dear God, um, I thank you so much um, for everything that you do for us, and I thank you uh, just for this church that we were able to gather here to together as a, as a body, as a family, um, and, and devote this time to you. Uh, that we can give praise to you, that we can uh, lift up uh, your name 
um, and just learn more and grow deeper in our relationship with you, God. Uh, and so help us do that. We love you. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, let's do some standing this morning and let's sing about our freedom in Christ this morning. Here we go. Who am I that the highest were welcome? I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Lift it up. Whom the sun sets free. Oh, is free. Has ransomed me, his grace runs While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, he died for me. Whom the sun sets free, oh, is free. Sing with me this morning. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. Are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Lift it up now. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Lift it up now, one more time. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Lift it up one more time. Chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am.
This morning, that's what I'm talking about. Lift up a joyful noise to the Lord. Amen. There we go. Let's continue worshiping this morning. And I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. Then you came along and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied and here in your love. Yes, it is, Lord. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. Lord, there's nothing. Just you now. That's what I'm talking about. Lift it up this morning. I'm not afraid. And I'm not afraid. Show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. Cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley, and there's not a place. Your mercy and grace won't find me again. Whoa, whoa, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Sing it now one more time. up with me now one more time turn my morning into dancing you turn morning to dancing you give beauty for ashes you turn shame into glory you're the only one who can sing it now you turn Now one more time. Lift it up with me. Here we go. Oh, there's 
That's what I'm talking about. Let's pray this morning. Father God, we are so thankful that you can bring energy into our hearts this morning. Lord, you've turned our morning into dancing and our graves into gardens. Lord, you can do anything. Lord, we are so thankful for you this morning. We are thankful for the freedom and the relationship that you offer to us through your son. Lord, would you be with Jed and Josh now as they continue to lead us in service this morning. Lord, we love you. In your son's name, amen. You guys may be seated this morning. Ooh, man, can I just get an amen for our amazing worship team? Like, oh, man. And you guys are sounding fantastic this morning, just by the way. So, um, no, so uh, recently I've been going through this deep dive through Genesis. Um, you know, the first book of the Bible, and there's a lot of important stories and people that we learn about in these stories. You know, people that we, you know, in our faith, would, we would say are pillars. You know, when we look at like the story of Noah or Abraham or Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, uh, you know, these people that we find synonymous with incredible faith. And, and I was walking through all these different stories and I found something interesting. You know, I Growing up, I always, you know, kind of put these guys on pedestals. You know, these guys, I, I wish that I could live up to what they were. And as I was reading these stories, I became more and more aware of what flawed human beings they were. That every single one of them had their own things that they struggled with. I mean, you know, and it's just crazy to think about, you know, like, Man, that, you know, and, and not necessarily a faith-shaking moment, but it's just like, wow, I, I don't know if I've ever realized how human these guys are. And what I, you know, and I knew this, but I came to realize even deeper is that the success that they had, the things that they accomplished was truly God. <laughs> it was truly God. And so then, I, you, know, I, you know, it makes me go through this thinking process, and I'm like, okay, so why these people? Why, these, why Abraham? Why Isaac, Jacob, Joseph? Why, why did God work through these people? And I think what I came to was just a simple thing. They made themselves available. They made themselves available. Available. God came to Abraham, hey, I want to do amazing things through you. I need you to come over to this land over here. And Abraham said, okay. And he went. God came to Noah, hey, I need, I'm going to restart the earth and I want to do it through you. I need you to build this boat. And Noah's like, okay. Joseph, there was the, you know, the last story of Genesis and it's this crazy story of a, a guy who's thrown into slavery by his own brothers, and he ends up being second to command of Egypt just behind Pharaoh. I mean, the way it talks about, you know, like, it makes me think of, like, you know, how England is run nowadays. You know, you have the monarchy, you have the queen, 
you know, she doesn't really do or make a lot of decisions anymore, right? It's the prime minister that does a lot in England. And that's, that's the position that Joseph had, right? He was like the prime minister of Egypt, right? Pharaoh had just become a figurehead over it, but Joseph ran everything. And he got to that position because God said, hey, I am going to use you to interpret the Pharaoh's dream. And Joseph said, okay. He made himself available, God does so much for us. We come to this moment to, to recognize that, to recognize what his son has done for us, that, that yes, just like all these guys in Genesis, these pillars of our faith that were flawed human beings, that we too have our flaws, that we have our mistakes, but we come to this moment because Jesus has saved us from those mistakes and from those flaws. And what God asks is that we make ourselves available in all aspects of our life. We make our time available, that we make our relational capacity for others available. Right, as a church, we have a bold vision of what we want to accomplish, of what God wants to do through this family, through this body. And sometimes the simplest way to make this happen is to make yourself available. Available to volunteer. Available to give. Available to have dinner with someone. Available to just have a conversation. Available to invest in our community and available to invest in our neighbors around us. This is what God wants and and he has proven the incredible things that he can do with those who make themselves available. Will you pray with me? Dear God, I thank you so much for what your son has done for us. That as all human beings have been since Adam and Eve, we, we are flawed and we have sinned. We've made mistakes. But we come to this moment knowing that your son died for those mistakes. That's a life beyond them. And so now we want to pray something bold. We are available. Use us, God. Use us. Use us for our community. Use us for our neighbors. Use us to make an impact in those lives around us so that they can see what you have done, so they can see who you are, And so that we can live lives where somebody will look back and they'll see, man, God did incredible things through them because they were available. We love you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You know, as I talk about the exciting places that we want this church to go and the exciting things that we want this church to do, um, something else we have to recognize is that this church is where it's at right now because of generations of people who made themselves available. Um, I'm, across the world right now, there are churches that are struggling. I mean, the rural church in America is struggling greatly right now, but this church is different. And one of the reasons for that is because of generations of people who've made themselves available uh, and have given faithfully to this church. And, and, and we just want to thank you for that, that we know many of you have been a part 
of those generations and will continue to be a part of those generations. And, and that's what makes this church great is that God is using you to do incredible things and he's going to continue to use every single one of you to do incredible things, not just in Whiting, but in all of our surrounding communities. And so again, we thank you. And if you would like to give today to the offering, um, we have it available online where you can sign up on our website or we also have um, our box there in the back um, that you can give in. Um, but we thank you. And let me pray as I welcome Josh up to share um, the message this morning. Uh, dear God, oh, I thank you so much for what you've done through this church through the years. Uh, that, you know, as we see many rural churches struggling at this time, that this church stands strong because of the people that you have used and the people that have made themselves uh, available for generations now. And we ask that you continue to do that, that you continue to use us uh, to further this church, so that we can further your kingdom and we can continue to love those around us and to love where we live as best we can. God, we really do. We want to see more and more Christ-like communities around us and see the impact, not that I can just have here, but uh, not just nationally, but internationally. I want to pray for Josh as he comes up to share the message this morning, that it, that it is clear that this is not just from him, but this is you speaking through him this morning, that there is something that you want us to hear out of this message, that there is something in here that you want us to walk away with, that we don't just hear it today, but it rings in our ears for the next week, and we live it out as we go about our lives. We thank you again. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. would help if I turned my mic on. There we go. <laughs> well, hey, good morning. good morning. Good morning, everybody. Holy cow. Yes. Holy cow. All right. So real quick, we are a church today. I want to just echo what, what Jed said. We are a church today that is sitting on, on, on really a, a level of health that is not seen in a lot of churches right now in America, especially in smaller towns. And I want to echo what Jed said about just thanking you from the bottom of my heart um, uh, for seeing that alive in our church here. I am personally excited. Like, I hope that, I hope that translates here, because I am excited about the road ahead for Whiting Christian Church. I am incredibly excited because I think we are uniquely positioned today, right now, uniquely positioned to see just an outpouring of God's Spirit right here in Western Iowa, right here, starting right in these seats. I see a, a, a future here for our church where we have a community that is pouring out God's grace in every, every neighborhood that we, we interact with. I see a church that is focused on our neighbors. I see a church that is devoted to seeing the Spirit of God rise in our communities, in our towns, not just in Whiting, but in Ottawa, in Sloan, in Hornick, in Mapleton, in Sioux City, in Omaha, in Iowa, in the world. And it starts here in our neighborhood. I am excited to see what God is going to continue to do in and through us, in and through you for the days ahead. Because we could sit here and go, yeah, we're a good church. And then just continue to show up on Sunday morning and do our hour and then go home and continue to go, yeah, we're a good church. And just kind of hover there. But I'm not content with that. I want to see us become the spear point of what God is doing in Western Iowa. I want to see a kingdom grow in and around us. I want to see God use us. So we're going to be talking a little bit about that today, a series uh, that we're calling The Return. And so we're going to kind of dive into that a bit about what, what it looks like at this stage to commit, to make decisions, to, make, to commit to growing this kingdom, and then also what it looks like to celebrate 
that coming kingdom as well. But first, I want to talk to you about some very real stuff that's coming up here. Uh, we had talked a little bit about this morning, and you saw a slide up about the 4th of July coming up. Um, this is going to be, yeah, thank you for throwing up that slide. This right here is going to be kind of a, a, a practical application of some of the stuff that we've been talking about. 4th of July, we have a front lawn service. So when you come to church, when you come to church in two weeks, uh, we'll not be meeting in here. We're going to be meeting right outside, and we're going to be inviting the whole town to come worship with us. All right? We're inviting everybody to come worship God with us. We're going to celebrate what God is doing in and through this community, and we're going to celebrate it right outside, pointed to the rest of Whiting, and we want all you guys to join us. We'll have some chairs available, but bring your lawn chair and, uh, and come get ready to worship right alongside our brothers and sisters in our area. We're going to worship alongside our community right outside, and we're going to sing loud, and we're going to sing proud. Woo! I like that. We, we, want, we want God's worship to echo throughout every single neighborhood here in Whiting. We want everybody to know that we're singing and we're worshiping Jesus right here. A part of that day, this becomes a time, because see, here's the thing. If we're going to be a church that builds this kingdom in western Iowa, we have to start locally. We have to, we have to start here on our streets, start in our neighborhoods. We have to, to really just push out and find, find a way to, to be visible and be loud and be interacting and blessing our neighbors. And so one of the things that we're doing is we're taking a very active role in 4th of July this year. You're going to see, uh, we've sponsored a part of the rodeo, we're sponsoring part of the chicken dinner, um, and we're also going to have a float in the parade. We're going to be throwing candy out to kids and inviting people to come to church. Um, I'm going to challenge you here for a second. If you want to help with that float, that little connection card you got, just write parade float on it. And when you toss it in the uh, um, offering box at the end of the service, I'll collect it at the end of the day, and you will hear from me. We will take all the help we can get about putting that float together. We actually have a good start. We just need hands to, to help and creative minds to look at what we got and make it better. All right? So if you want to help in that way, let us know by filling out the connection card. If at any point during this sermon you hear something that you want to react to as well, where you feel like, no, no, that's something I can do. Oh, no, God gave me an idea. That's how I can invest in my community. I want to challenge you to also write that on the comment card. Write that on the connection card and toss it in the offering box because I will follow up with you this week because I want to be a church that chases after those things. I want to be a church that is active in our community. All right? Well, hey, here's some review. For these past several weeks, we've been looking specifically at the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. All right? These are the books in the Old Testament that describe the, the Jewish people coming home, coming back to Jerusalem after 70 years in exile. 70 years living in a land that is not their own living this entire time hoping for the day where they get to go home. And so we've been looking through this story and, and kind of piecing what we can about this, this, this process of moving back and, and planting this, this new kingdom, um, this promised kingdom, getting ready for the Messiah, getting ready for this new kingdom that God has promised, and seeing what we can learn from the Jewish people and how we can apply that to our own mission here in Western Iowa, building God's kingdom. So first, the Jews were allowed to return their homeland after 70 years in exile, and the big kind of mentality in that process was that they were going forward, not backward. Even though they were going back to their homeland, they had this mindset that when they were going back to their homeland, they're going to be building this kingdom that God had promised, the future kingdom. They didn't want to go back to the way things were 70 years ago, because that was a situation that was rife with, with problems and, and sin. And it was the whole reason that the people of God were sent into exile to begin with. And so they didn't want to recreate the problematic empire. They wanted to create the empire that God had promised, the new kingdom. And so there was this idea that the Jews were going back into Jerusalem to do it right. They were going back into Jerusalem to build God's kingdom for tomorrow. And what did, they get to do? what did they get to work doing right in the beginning? First they built the temple, sorry, first they built the altar, and then they began building the temple. The altar is this place of forgiveness and atonement, and so the first thing they did was set up a method by which we can embrace our forgiveness, our atonement, and then the next thing they did was build the temple, the place by which the community gathers and celebrates God and worships together as a community, showing us the importance, how vital it is, 
to have to, to, to rest on forgiveness, to rest on worship, to rest on community in building this new kingdom. Then we see that the project draws opposition. We started talking about that, how this project of building this kingdom draw, drew opposition from their neighbors. But there was something unique about this opposition. It was an opposition that was largely self-created because the people of God uh, seemed to have so much pride in, in their own identity, in their own project, that they wouldn't let the outsiders come in. They wouldn't let the, their neighbors join in the mission of God. And that sparked resentment, which started this, this opposition that slowed down the building of the temple. And so we learned that you know, the mission of God, as prophesied in the Old Testament, was uh, the, 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 the kingdom of God was supposed to be a blessing for all people, not just the Jewish people, that God was going to use the Jewish people to bless the world. And here we had this group of people that's like, no, 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 it's for us. And because of that, they started to draw opposition. This idea of exclusivity, this exclusion, needless exclusion, brought needless opposition. Then we talked about Nehemiah going out and inspecting the walls and the infrastructure of the town and how he actually took time and devoted time in his book to explaining walking methodically through the, the, the walls to inspect exactly where repairs need to be made and exactly what kind of repairs needed to be made. And this kind of shows us that we need to be aware of the problems that exist and respond to the needs that actually exist. Not just the needs that we want to fulfill, but the needs that actually exist in our communities. The needs that we actually see. And those are the challenges that we need to face. And then Nehemiah began to plan for resistance. He began to work resistance, work uh, uh, opposition into the plan by stationing, stationing guards around the walls. We talked about how Nehemiah built this plan to restore the kingdom, but he built this plan with the understanding that there are people that are going to try to upset it. There are forces in this world that are going to try and upset the plan. So rather than be surprised when opposition arrives, he worked opposition into the plan and said, all right, this is what we're going to do. We're going to build the kingdom. We're going to build the walls. We're going to build the roads. We're going to do all this. Now, when the day comes when you get attacked, and you will. Heads up. Here's our, here's our plan for that. And it taught us that as we endeavor to build this kingdom in western Iowa, we need to work opposition into our plan. No plan survives implementation, not 100%. So we need to understand that we will meet resistance. And then when we meet resistance, we have to work that in to our expectations Work that into our plan. Pray over that now so that when that day comes, we're not surprised. We're not sidetracked. We're not sideswiped and knocked off our feet. Oh, we expected this. We practiced for it. It's good. We're good. And so what that looks like here is that means building each other up, encouraging one another, and being ready for the opposition that comes. And then last week, we talked about the, uh, the steps that Nehemiah took to rebuild a culture of compassion. How he fed the starving people from his own allotment of food. How he stopped any sort of practice of praying on the weak, stopped causing harm, seek to restore people's needs, restore them back to their full human status, and then worked to redeem them in God. And likewise, that's our mission with the world around us. We need to, to identify areas that we may be inadvertently harming others. We need to learn to stop that harm. We need to find ways to restore people that are suffering, restore people that are hurting. And then finally, the ultimate mission, work towards building relationships of redemption so that people can know the full grace and full freedom available to them in Jesus. So this has all been coming from this book of Ezra and Nehemiah. And today, we're getting near the end of this, this section of Scripture. And we're going to specifically look at this section where we're talking about two big steps in building this kingdom. Two steps that I'm calling revival and celebration. And it's steps, these two words we hear a lot thrown around in church, revival and celebration. And we're going to look at those. We're going to look at what that means to the, uh, to the people in, in Jerusalem, 
what it means for the church, what it means in the gospel, and what would it would mean for us to fully embrace this idea of revival and to truly embrace this idea of celebration in Jesus' name. So we're just going to jump right in here. We're going to go right into Nehemiah. We're going to go into chapter 8. And I'm going to be jumping around a little bit between uh, chapter 8 and chapter 9. There's a lot of text here, and I'd like to get through some stuff. Um, so uh, we're going to start in 818, but pretty much right after that verse, I'm going to jump right over to, to chapter 9. So if you're following along in your Bible, be aware of that. If you're following along on the screen, uh, don't worry, we'll, we'll make the switches for you. So here we go. Nehemiah 8, verse 18. Day after day. From the first day to the last, Ezra read from the book of the law of God. They read scripture. They celebrated the festival for seven days, and on the eighth day, in accordance with the regulation, there was an assembly. So real quick, he's been been reading the book of the law to the people. They've been celebrating the festivals as prescribed by the law. And then continuing in Nehemiah 9. On the 24th day of the same month, the Israelites gathered together fasting and wearing sackcloth and putting dust on their heads. This is a way of showing mourning and and, uh, 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 repentance. Verse 2. Those of Israelite descent had separated themselves from all the foreigners. They stood in their places. They confessed their sins and the sins of their ancestors. They stood where they were and they read from the book of the law the book of the law of the Lord their God for a quarter of the day and spent another quarter in confession and in worship of of, of God, of Lord their God. They spent half the day resting on God's word and on repentance, on confessing sins, on worshiping. Remember, these people are in this situation of rebuilding this kingdom because generation after generation after generation after generation fell further and further into corruption. And so they're taking this moment. They're like, okay, we've built the altar. We've built the, the temple. We've built the walls. We've, we've embraced compassion. We need to, to, to set the stone on this kingdom. And they start it through confession. They start it through understanding, through embracing the sins that they themselves have committed, but also the sins of their ancestors. Recommitting the people of God towards building this new kingdom the way God meant it to be. The people gathered to read the law. They gathered together and spent half the day. Half the day. You guys think I preach a long time. Holy cow. Imagine if I kept you here for like six hours. I I don't know that I have the voice for that. (laughs) So Suddenly a half hour sermon doesn't seem so bad. (laughs) No, they gathered for half the day so that they, not just individuals, but that they as a people, as a group, understood scripture so completely that it it was embraced as part of their identity. They understood God's word for them. Therefore, they understood who they were in accordance to God's plan. They spent half the day in that gathering out in the sun, in the new temple, listening to God's word and chewing on the reality of God's word, of understanding what that means for them. It's interesting how they break this up. Quarter of that, the quarter of the day was spent actually just listening to the word, and the other quarter was spent meditating on God's word, worshiping, confessing, putting it into application. They spent half the day making sure that their identity was understood, that they embraced what scripture, what God told them about who they were and what their mission was. They needed to understand their place in the kingdom understand their place in the world so that they can build this kingdom. Now we're going to continue here in verse 32. Now therefore our God, the great God, mighty and awesome, I love that, who keeps his covenant of love. These are the people, by the way, making their commitment. This is them, their voice. 
Do not let all of this hardship that we've suffered seem trifling in your eyes. The hardship that has come on us, on our kings, on our leaders, on our priests, and on our prophets, on our ancestors, and all of your people. From the days of the kings of Assyria until today, in all that has happened to us, you, God, have remained righteous. You have acted faithfully while we acted wickedly. Our kings, our leaders, our priests, and our ancestors did not follow your law. They did not pay attention to your commands or to the statutes you warned them to keep. Even while they were in their kingdom, enjoying your great goodness to them in the spacious and fertile land you gave them, they did not serve you or turn from their evil ways. In other words, as a people, they spent this time learning the word of God, making sure they understood it, learning what their identity was, learning where generation, genera, let's try that again, learning that through the generations, there we go, that's a better way of saying it, where they had fallen short, where they had missed the boat on what it means to be a follower of God, and they confessed it. They confessed it right to, they're like, look, we messed up and we've messed up for a long time and we don't want that history to define us moving forward. These people went on to make a new promise to God. They promised to once again honor the promises of their forefathers, to once again keep the covenant that God had given them. Covenant is just a big fancy church word to mean promise. All right? They would keep their rulers accountable. They promised that as a people, we will keep our kings, we will keep our nobles, we will keep our rulers accountable to God's word. They promised that they would not neglect the upkeep of the temple and the worship practices, that part of their covenant, part of their promise was like, look, this is so important. We're going to embrace this mission that we are not going to neglect the word of God. We're not going to neglect the work of the temple. They made this promise as a group, as a people, deliberately, vowing to build this new kingdom from this position of forgiveness and new beginnings, built by God's hand and God's direction, not human desire. And that's important right there. Because they made this promise because they understood that as a people... They were built, for years they acted on human desire, human desire for power, human desire for wealth, while enjoying these blessings of God that they took for granted. So as a people, as a group, they confessed all of that to God. Like, we took you for granted. We took these blessings for granted. We don't want to do that anymore. We want to be your people. So therefore, we make a new promise today on the shoulders of that promise you made to Abraham, to Moses, to David. We're building that kingdom that you intended to build. And this was a deliberate commitment. What's interesting here is the participation of the people. This was not spectators. This was not the people of God just simply sitting in a chair for half a day or anything. This was a deliberate choice, a deliberate commitment of the community of God to embrace the mission that God had given them. We are meant to be participants in the kingdom. I'm going to say that again. If you're writing something down, write this down. We are meant to be participants in the kingdom. Amen. The kingdom of God is not something that we sit on the sidelines for. It's not something that we just spectate and watch happen around us. It is something that we actively participate in, that we make deliberate commitments, deliberate decisions to engage in that growth. It means stepping up to the bar and building community with your neighbors. It means embracing the gospel in such a way that it may become uncomfortable at times for you personally. But we are meant to embrace participation in the gospel, participation in the kingdom, 
to make deliberate decisions to grow his kingdom in our world, not merely spectate what he's doing. Here's the beautiful thing. This is in my notes, but this is one of my favorite facts about God when it comes to the kingdom. All right. Um, it's interesting because people ask all the time, you know, they, they, when I talk about building the kingdom, their response is, yeah, yeah, because, you know, God needs you to build the kingdom. And, and I, I would say that's actually wrong thinking because God is perfect. God is perfect. Sorry for those of you following all my notes. I'm off script right now. Don't worry. <laughs> but God is perfect. God actually, here, here's, here's something that's mind-blowing to me. God is perfect. He doesn't actually need us in what he's doing. Like, he doesn't actually need us because he doesn't need anything. He's perfect. He completely is perfect in every way. He doesn't need us in that situation. So if you're thinking that, get away from that thought because there's something else going on here. God doesn't need us to build his promise. He invites us to participate. It's not that we're needed to belly up to the bar to do this difficult task. We get to participate in the life-changing reality of God on this planet. We're not needed. God doesn't need us. He's inviting us to participate because it's that awesome, because it's that amazing. He doesn't need me to be up here and preach. I get the joy of being able to participate in what God is doing in and through church leadership, and I love it. You are being invited to participate in the growing kingdom, not because God somehow needs you, but because God has invited you to use the unique gifts that you've been created with, the unique outlook that you've been created with, to be able to invest those gifts into the kingdom in such a way to watch life change happen around you because you chose, like Jed said, to say, okay, I'm going to answer God's call. Here I am. Send me. We have to make deliberate decisions to participate in the kingdom. Deliberate decisions. We are not spectators. Building this new kingdom takes a deliberate decision, a deliberate commitment to follow God's rules for us. A deliberate decision to see people as he sees them, not as the categories that we tend to fall back on. A deliberate decision to work for the blessing, restoration, and redemption of everyone, not just ourselves. That is amazing, but it takes a deliberate decision. I can preach till I'm blue in the face. Jed can preach till he's blue in the face. We can set up every program in this church that we want. We can have small groups. We can have VBS. We can have parties, and all of that is awesome. But none of, that, none of that matters nearly as much as your personal choice to deliberately participate in the kingdom. To deliberately find ways to invest your gifts, to invest your ability, your passions, your mindset, your unique outlook on life, to invest that into the kingdom and to find out how to bless your neighbors. I can tell you a thousand times to do it, but you have to make that deliberate decision to say, you know what, I'm going to trust God and I'm going to let God change the world through me because that's going to be fun because it is. All right. You've heard me talk about revival a lot. You've heard this word throw around. We're revival, just kind of quick definition of this word. Revival is about new life being injected in God's community. And frequently you'll hear church people talk, it's like, well, we're praying for revival. And yes, you want to pray for revival. Ask God to bring revival to his church. Absolutely. But understand, revival is not something that you're going to spectate. If you want God to bring revival into this church, into this area, into this city, into this country, into this world, we need to actively participate in that revival. We need to step up and allow God to use us to bless the people around us. All right? Revival is not something you spectate. Revival is something you participate in. So once they gathered together, once the people gathered together, they consecrated themselves. They made this commitment before God. And as an entire people, they made this commitment to, to embrace this mission, to bless the world, to build God's kingdom. What did they do? 
Nehemiah chapter 12, verse 7. And actually, no, not this verse. We're going to jump ahead to Nehemiah chapter 12, verse 7. Do I have the wrong verse for you guys? All right, then I will just read it. <laughs> My fault. Oh, it's not verse 7. It's verse 27. <laughs> So I'm just going to read it to you. That's my mistake. Verse 27. At the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem. Okay, so they've gathered together. They've read the law. They've done all this. At the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, the Levites were sought out. These are the people that historically have been the, the priests of the temple. Were sought out where they lived and were brought to Jerusalem to celebrate joyfully the dedication of the wall of the temple with songs of thanksgiving, with the music of cymbals, with the music of harps and lyres. What did the people do? What did the people do after they made this commitment? What did the people do when they embraced this mission? When they said, we're going to be a people that's about this. What did they do? They celebrated. They had a party. After they had established the mission and built the structures of this new kingdom, after they had fully embraced what it means to step up and participate fully in the kingdom, after they had done all this and made their commitment to go forward, they threw a party. And it was a loud party with cymbals and dancing and lyres and harps. They had a party. They celebrated joyfully. You know, in our culture today, church people, we tend to get a bad rap when it comes to celebration. Am I wrong? Culture tends to view us, church people, like, like stodgy, like dour, like we're always so serious. Man, if we were, if, if we were living on, on, uh, on, uh, on target for what Scripture describes us as, that would not be the case. I think a lot of you get that, because this, this is a happy church. <laughs> but like, check this out, Psalm 150. Psalm 150 says this, Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Verse 3, praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and the lyre. Praise him with the, the timbrel and the dancing. Praise him with the strings and the pipe. Praise him with the clash of cymbals. Praise him with the resounding cymbals. Not just the clash, the resounding, the echo of the cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Folks, as church people, we have earned this reputation in our culture of being dour, of being serious, of being quiet. Everything has to be somber. Did you know that Whiting Christian Church has named celebration as one of our key values? This is before I got here, um, and it's one of the things that drew me here, in all honesty. But if you go to our website, if you go to the About page, you can actually see the six core values of Whiting Christian Church. And two of them are specifically about celebration. Not just one, two. One of them is about celebrating transformation, celebrating life transformation, and the other one is relishing the good times. And in fact, the wording under that on our website says, True joy comes only from transformation we experience through God's grace we celebrate and glorify God for that endless joy that he provides. I think that is amazing because that is on point. Who decided in the past that the church needed to be so serious all the time? Guys, we can be happy. We can celebrate. We can throw parties. In fact, I would even say that as church people, as Jesus people, as Jesus followers, we need to be the most celebratory. We get to be the loudest partiers. We get to be the most vibrant celebrating people out there because we've experienced what freedom truly is. Let me spell this out for you. As Jesus followers, we have the single greatest reason to celebrate that has ever existed. We have been given the greatest gift that anyone can ask for. All the messes from our past, they no longer matter. All the scars, all the weight, all the burdens, all the failure, 
that the rest of the world tries to, to define us with, that the, the, the weights and scars that we carry on ourselves, none of that defines us anymore. Jesus has offered us freedom from that. He's offered to take all of that from us. That your background no longer matters. Your, your mistakes no longer matter. Your failures are gone. You get, to be, you get to be a full child of God to embrace this idea as a fully loved member of the family of God. The creator of the universe not only thinks you're important, but loves you so much that he went to the cross so that you didn't have to. And then beat death on your behalf. There's literally not a greater reason to celebrate. We have been given freedom, not just freedom of speech or freedom of religion or you know, the, the, the governmental freedom that we enjoy, but we've been given freedom from sin, freedom from failure, freedom from death. Living forever with God in heaven. Hallelujah. There is no greater reason to celebrate than that freedom. Celebration is part of the gospel experience because we're free. So celebrate joyfully with reckless abandon. Dance in the streets. Sing loud on Sunday morning. Sing loud in your kitchen. Like, sing loud. We can be joyful, we can be happy, we can be goofy, because guess what? We're saved and we're free. That's awesome. So there's these ideas of commitment, this commitment to revival, this, this, this deep understanding of our own sin and our own weight and bringing that to God. But then once we have laid our failures at the feet of God, once we have laid our sin and our mistakes at the feet of God, and embrace this mission to move forward in what God's kingdom truly can be. Man, we get to celebrate, we get to party, we get to, we get to, to, to be goofy, we get to sing loud. We get to be God's people, joyfully celebrating our newfound freedom out in the world. We have a mission. I keep saying that every week, and I mean it. We have a mission. And we need to see it through. We need to see it through. We need to, to deliberately decide if we're going to step up to that mission and change the world. And that means throwing our, our, our sin and our faith, what it is, and making the commitment to move forward as God's people out of here, as God's people who are seeking to embrace God's mission, not just for me individually, but for our entire community, for our entire region, for the world. The truly difficult task, by the way, the truly difficult task in all of that is not necessarily making that commitment, although that's a big deal. The truly difficult task is staying committed, but we're going to actually talk about that next week. But now, today, just like the Jews coming home to Jerusalem, we need to commit to the path ahead. To take this deliberate step and say, yes, here I am, send me, okay, here I go, God, I'm ready. Show me what I need to do to invest in your kingdom. To take up this mission and to build God's kingdom here in Western Iowa. Just like the Hebrews before us. We build that kingdom from a place of forgiveness, from a place of compassion. We lay our past mistakes at the feet of the cross, at the feet of Jesus. And we say, no more, we're not going to be that corrupt, flawed human being that we were before. We're going to be new, we're going to be changed, and we're going to be... It, entirely identified by the love of God that is so overwhelming that it pours out in every relationship that we have. That we're going to fully embrace our identity as children of God. As this powerful kingdom built right here in western Iowa. We want people to notice how powerful God is here because we're going out and we're blessing the world because we're loving people so completely that even like gas station attendants and, and waiters and waitresses and the guy who repairs your car is just struck by your joy, by your hope, by your love for them. I want to see a holy wake behind God's people that they don't even need to interact with you. They just need to see you in the distance and be like, whoa, whoa. God is doing something in their life. We need to be that people. 
me tell you something. If you're, looking at, if you're hearing me say this and you're thinking, yeah, it'd be nice if we changed the world. The disciples did it with 12. We got a lot more than 12 people in here. We got a lot more than 12 people in here. If we all embrace this mission that God has laid on our hearts, if we all embrace this life-changing compassion and allow ourselves to be used by God fully, I guarantee you, you will see change like nothing else at your doorstep, with your neighbors, in school, at work. It's amazing what God does with true, unbridled joy. And then just like the Hebrews, we will celebrate. We got a whole bunch of places to celebrate this this summer. Like I said, we got the 4th of July coming up where we get to put our our joy on display for the entire entire community. We're going to sing so loud that everybody hears us sing. It's going to be awesome. And then we also got stuff coming up this summer. We have the back to school bash. We're, we're beginning to plan right now as a way to bless our students. We got the steak and car night as a way to, to bless uh, guys that are coming in, be able to look at some really cool cars and also maybe some build some community at that time. We have all of these ideas right now just in the short term that we as a community can embrace opportunity to celebrate joyfully with our community, with our neighbors. But I need you to make that active, deliberate decision to participate. I'm promising you, God is going to do some amazing things here at Whiting Christian Church in the, in the season to come. And you get to be invited to participate in that kingdom today. So uh, back to those connect cards. Through this conversation, if God's been moving you about uh, being able to step up to something and be able to serve in one of our ministries, being able to uh, uh, even help out with a prayed float, or maybe there's this entirely other idea that you've been having that God's been pulling on your heart for the last couple weeks that you want me to know about, that Connect card is a great way. Just write it on that card, and you can toss it in the offering box at the end of the service. I will personally read every single card. All right? Promise. And it'll be between you and me. And if you want to help out with one of those things, I'll reach out to you and be like, hey, let's talk. How do we get you connected with this? If you have your own idea, I'll reach out to you. Hey, great idea. How do, how do we help? I want to see the world change through you. All right? God is building this kingdom through us. We have work to do. We have commitments to make. And we have celebrations to plan. Let's get to work, right? All right, let's pray. Dear Father God, here we are. Send us. Send us. I just want to take this moment here, God. For those of us that are, that are praying alongside me here, we confess our failures. We confess the places in our lives that we've got it wrong that we've acted in self-interest rather than kingdom interest. The times where we've dismissed individuals or not seen people as the way they've seated or, or for some reason been selfish, God, we confess that and we lay it at your feet. We no longer want to be defined by our failures or our missteps. Instead, we want to, as a people, move forward, as a group, move forward, embracing your holy mission to change the world through your compassion, through your love, through your grace, through your gospel good news. So here we are. We commit ourselves, God. We commit ourselves. We want to step up and be a full participant in the kingdom. Show us how to invest our gifts, move in our hearts, disrupt our lives so that we can fully embrace this mission and give us the freedom to be joyful, to celebrate so joyfully that there's this holy wake behind each and every one of us, that as we step out of this space today, every single person we interact with, even those at a distance, are struck by the Holy Spirit presence that they just see something different this release, this freedom, this joy, this people, defined not by our backgrounds or opinions, but instead defined by the fact that we're each forgiven for, by you and that we want desperately the rest of the world to know that same forgiveness. God, I pray that you bless 
our community outreach endeavors this summer. I pray that you give us each uh, opportunities to intersect with our communities, with our towns, with our neighbors, to build relationships. Give us opportunities, opportunities to show what your love means in the real world on Monday, on Wednesday, on Thursday, not just Sunday morning. Here we are. Send us. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you stand with me one last time as we sing our final song this morning? I just want to challenge you. Give it all you have this morning. You are the Lord Almighty, outshining all the stars in glory. Your love is like the wildest ocean. Oh, nothing else compares. Will you join with me this morning? Your love so great, Jesus in all things. I see the glimpse of your heart a billion years. Still I'll be singing. How can I praise you enough? How can I praise you enough? You are the Lord Almighty, outshining all the stars in glory. Your love is like the wildest ocean, no, nothing else compares. Lift it up with me this morning. Creation calls. Creation calls all to the Savior. We are alive for your praise in earth and sky. No one is higher. Our God of wonders, you reign. Our God of wonders, you reign. Whoa, you are the Lord Almighty. I'll shine in all the stars. Come on now. Not to us, but to your name. We lift up all praise. Not to us, but to your name. We lift up all praise. Not to us, but to stars in glory your love is like the wildest ocean and do nothing else compares yeah you are the lord almighty now shining all the stars in glory your love is like the wild The stars in glory. Your love is like the wildest ocean. Do nothing else compares. Yeah.
pray with me this morning? Father God, you are the Lord Almighty, outshining all the stars in glory. Your love is like the wildest ocean, and nothing else compares to you. Lord, we call to you this morning in celebration. Lord, the 4th of July is coming up. It's another wonderful reminder of your freedom. Lord, help us just continue to celebrate as hard as we can and join as many others with us as possible. Lord, we love you, and let us continue to worship you into this next week. We love you in your son's name. Amen. You guys, always a fun time. We'll see you next week.